topic of my message today, who am I? Who am I? This is the question of the ages and the sages. Countless souls have capitulated. Countless souls have given in to deep existential crisis. The crisis of being. This crisis of being manifests itself in overt and covert ways. In overt ways, it manifests itself in all kinds of egoistic behaviors, destructive addictions, and often suicide. In covert ways, it manifests itself in ideological, cultural, political, and religious alliances, and even cultism and gangsterism. These alliances, especially the religious alliance, often take the place of God. These alliances often lock the individual in a network of fear and guilt and anxiety, apart from which the individual has no identity. Once they leave or get kicked out of the group or the community or church, they are lost until perhaps they find another to give them a sense of identity or perhaps they descend into destructive behavior. I belong to a little circle of Seventh-day Adventist friends as a teenager. Among us was a young man who seemed so conscious. But he just started hopping from one religious affiliation to the next, trying to find the truth. I'm wondering up to today, he seemed like he was really trying to find himself, I think. I had a student many years ago in Jamaica, looked so much like a conscious young man, and very surprised when I found out he got killed with the David Koresh movement in Waco, Texas. What on earth is happening here? Identity. Let's talk about identity. And indeed, this is the month of February when we focus on black history and black self-identity. Isn't that so? Now, I, Olive Hemings, black woman, Jamaican, American, Seventh-day Adventist, minister of the gospel, college professor, sibling, cousin, aunt, grand-aunt, wife, mother, does this answer the question of my being? This is a reality. This is a thing. I can perfectly live out this identity without ever coming to know who I am. For the most part, we identify ourselves based on the sum total of our experiences. Now, human experience includes gender, sexual orientation, race, class, education, nationality, immigration status, religion, denomination, belief system, memory, and all the ups and downs of our lives, and various other events that may or may not be unique to the individual or the group. All these elements of experience make up what we call the personality. But personality is not who I am. The word personality comes from the Latin persona. Now, the Latin persona actually means mask. So back in the ancient world, when the actors would come on stage, they would put on a persona, a mask. It's merely a mask. It's a mosaic of temporal experience. But personality does not answer the question, who am I? According to the Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung, the privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. Now, John is not talking about personality. Neither is he talking about the ego that emerges from personality. The question transcends the ego. 
Now let's talk about ego. The term ego literally means I. It is actually the Greek personal pronoun ego. Epsilon, gamma, omega, E, G, long O. We anglicize the pronunciation and say ego, but the Greek is ego. So the ego is the I, as in self-interest. The ego causes us to see ourselves as separate from others and the things that sustain us. Now, the ego has two major interdependent manifestations. First, there's the individual ego, the individual self-interest. And then there's the collective ego, the group interest. A particular group with a common self-interest is a collective ego. And the individual self is of necessity part of a group or several groups. Any one of you here belong to, any, to several groups, not just one group. Your family, your denomination, your race, and so forth. The individual ego in turn is vitally hooked to the collective ego. We often identify as collectives, African-American, black male, black female, Latinx, or Seventh-day Adventist. These may all function as collective egos because each group has a common identity towards common survival interests. It's for this reason that you have lobbies. They are vying for the interests of a particular group. Now, when the major preoccupation is the survival of the group, as separate and apart from others, regardless of the interests of others, the group becomes a collective ego. It's a collective ego because it is chiefly defined by its self-interest towards survival of the group. The actions of the collective ego reflect the norms and boundaries that it prescribes and marks off against others. Hmm? So the collective ego is the most powerful and volatile manifestation of the ego. It can wield absolute power over the individual to the extent that the individual ego cannot grasp the fact that the collective ego cannot survive without it. It's like a great big bully. A very significant example of a collective ego is the faith community. It can be even more brutal than other groups precisely because it sets itself apart from others as superior in its understanding of God. Generally, this aura of superiority is a matter of survival. This is why those who belong to such groups may come under severe scrutiny on how they conform to the norms, the dogmas, the doctrines, and lifestyle of the group. If I had on an airing this morning, people would be looking and wouldn't hear what I say. And the average member of the group conforms in the interest of his or her survival for fear of losing their livelihood, for fear of being ostracized or stigmatized or even ridiculed. So the collective ego tends to co-opt the individual conscience. Let's take an example. A pastor wants to ordain a woman as head elder of his congregation because he does not see anyone more capable than this sister. Hmm? But he decides against it. She has his eye on the conference presidency. Hmm? He wants to be conference president. Election coming up next year. His chauvinistic colleagues may vote him down if they fear that he ordains, uh, because they hear that he ordains a woman as his first elder. What has happened here? 
the collective ego hijacks his conscience, hijacks his consciousness because his own self-interest and self-identity is hooked to it. A faith community is not necessarily, does not have to be a collective ego. But when a faith community loses its spiritual direction to nurture individuals towards unity with God, when its focus is on the individual's conformity to the group rather than the individual's relationship with God, when its identity becomes narcissistic, when its focus is on its own survival, it becomes a collective ego. And it's a time brutal and insane. I'll give you an example. There's a point in the history of this country when the collective ego, in the name of Christian values, displayed itself in the splendor of its insanity. It was a case of the Little Rock Nine. Ever heard about the Little Rock Nine? And I had the privilege last year, April, to uh, be in the presence of one of them up at Walla Walla University where I responded to his speech there. In 1957, Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas had become a test case for racial segregation in America. Nine high-achieving black kids were offered up as the guinea pigs. Now, three years earlier, the Supreme Court had ruled that the segregation of schools was unconstitutional. But in the South, where Jim Crow collective ego ruled with a mighty hand, they dragged their feet and refused to bend. On the first day of school, an angry mob came out to intimidate these kids and prevent them from going into the school. By happenstance, on that first day of school, there was only one black student there to face the angry mob. Elizabeth Eckford. Is her name. They screamed, shouted obscenities, calling for her to be lynched as this girl clutched her folder and walked unflinchingly towards the school. Governor of Arkansas ordered security forces to stop her at the school door and she was chased away by the mob. The nine black students finally got into the school later that month, but only after President Eisenhower intervened and sent the 101st Airborne to escort them to school. They had to be escorted to school by security forces. But for an entire year, fellow students punched, spat on, and threw eggs on Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth is not the only star of that infamous movie scene captured by journalists for the annals of history. Another star in that was a young lady called Hazel Bryan. See that young lady screaming behind her? The hatred on Bryan's face as she screamed at Elizabeth to go back to Africa has gone down in history as a symbol of the evil of Jim Crowism. But to be fair, the girl, the same age as Elizabeth, was only part of a mob with her parents and other parents and community leaders as her mentor. Her own identity was lost in the identity of the group. Her own consciousness was hijacked. In later life, she came into consciousness she apologized to Elizabeth and they became lifelong friends. As a mother, I often ask, what parents would be part of this angry mob? What parents? Don't you have children who you want to go to school? And something frightening comes to mind. If the racial line were switched, could I have been one of those antagonists? 
blindly obeying the insane collective ego? These are questions we all must ask. Because this is not a black-white problem. This is a human problem. It comes in many colors. There's something out of joint in time and space, lost in the madness of fear and anxiety over our survival. You know, laws of change, huh? Laws of change for the greater good. And this is vital to collective responsibility. Such changes paint the portrait of a world yearning to come of age. But to what extent do laws really change us? Hmm? These barriers that we erect in the interest of survival, they never really disappear. They only shift. Because you see, the ego, the I, is needy and insatiable. Yesterday, 1957, there was a madness at Little Rock Central High School. Today, 2020, there's the insanity at El Paso border. Children locked in cages at the border, crying for their parents whom they may never see again. Christian institutions in general no longer practice segregation, right? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I teach at a university that used to be segregated, you know. So I'm there now, it's not segregated, right? <laughs> Have we really changed? Or... Have we really changed our laws and policies here? Or have we only changed our laws and policies here? And then we find a different set of barrier there. Hmm? We change it here, but then we go over here and we find another set of barriers to feed the insatiable ego. It's insatiable. This church, for example, may be over segregation in the school and in the pew. But it still holds on to segregation in the pulpit. Gender segregation. I have to remind a lot of people who invite me to preach Women's Day that I also preach on other days. We hold on to gender segregation, not for biblical or godly reasons. All the studies in our church show that. But in the interest of survival, we hold on to it. We call it unity. This unity is really the insecure collective ego. And so many have bought into this mob mentality rather than trust in God to do what is right. Where is trust? How can the madness end if there is no true transformation? Where is the revival and reformation? Is this revival and reformation slogan about true spirituality or is it about maintenance of the status quo, the survival of the collective ego? Now, Calvin Rock, who is a former vice president of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church, has written a book called Protest and Progress. The book gives the church an opportunity to examine its own self in the racial struggle. I was struck by one piece of history in the book. On page 88, Rock speaks of a letter titled, Urgent, 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 urgent. The letter was sent in 1978 from the pastor of a large congregation in the Arizona conference. It urged the desegregation of the Seventh-day Adventist schools. 
why was this an urgent matter for this pastor? It was an urgent matter for him because the IRS was about to withdraw tax exemption privilege from private schools that do not meet the racial integration quota of 20%. What is the problem here? It was a financial problem for him. It was not a moral or spiritual problem. I stand in hope but that by the grace of God, we do not sell our souls to the God called money because we are concerned about our survival. Where is trust? So the existential question remains, who am I? Apart from all this insanity, who am I? I heard a beautiful story this summer. I want to. And the story goes, there was a man at a Minnesota airport running to the departure gate, hoping he would not miss his flight. He's a big shot in his profession, going to speak at a large conference. He gets to the flight gate and finds a very long line. So he rushes up to the attendant at the gate. Ma'am, I cannot afford to miss this flight. Please check me in now. Sir, she politely said, everyone here in this long line is waiting for the same flight. Kindly join the line. The man straightened up his back, says, lady, do you know who I am? At this, the attendant picks up the microphone. Attention, everyone. There's a man here in the front who does not know who he is. Can somebody please help him? This essential dementia appears to be the general state of humanity. Unaware of, or rather forgetful of, who we really are. Because we define ourselves based on the ego, the personality, our particular social and religious alliances, the achievements, the triumphs, the failures, our physical appearances and our possessions, the rules, the doctrines and policies and peculiarities, the mask. What lies behind the mask? That is the quest of a lifetime. To go behind the mask is the spiritual path. Behind the mask is life, boundless life, in which we all participate. And this boundless life, some have called a cosmic identity. It is the true identity. What lies behind the mask is not I. There is no ego there. The Apostle Paul got it. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The ego slowly dies as the Christ spirit emerges. And the life I live is not mine. Let us talk about life. Now, this is my body, yes? Hmm? This, your, that's your body. Hmm? This is my mind, yes. Your mind. This is my denomination, your denomination. This is my race. Some of you can say the same. This is my race. But this life, this life, it is not mine. It is not yours. 
There's only one life and we all share in it. You know, some people like to say, this is my life, leave me alone. They really mean this is my lifestyle or this is my choice. <laughs> They're really talking about the ego, the mask. But life, life, boundless life, no one can own it. This world is chronically out of joint because of this futile grasping of the what does not belong to anyone or any particular group. When I shed the mask, my identity is with boundless life. It is cosmic. Cosmic identity. Now, cosmic identity was a focus of the early church. And note I say the early church. I did not say early Christianity. What has become a religion called Christianity bears little resemblance to the early church. Believe me, friends. That's a whole other conversation that I take up at other places from time to time. But suffice it to say, the early church was not a religion. It wasn't a religion. They call themselves the way. See it in Acts 9. It embraced particular Jews, uh, no, it, it embraced practicing Jews and non-practicing Jews. If you read all the letters of Paul, you'll see where the church embraced practicing Jews, non-practicing Jews. Kosher Gentiles, non-kosher Gentiles. Women, men, slaves, renegades and dissenters in a movement that labored for liberation in an oppressive Roman culture of domination. It's so all there in Galatians, Romans, Corinthians, where you see this struggling over who should eat what and not, not observe what and observe. Paul says, you all need to come together and do not allow food to hinder the work of God. Food there is just symbolic of your differences. Some eat, some do not eat. Some observe, some do not observe. We have among us slaves, women, Gentiles, men, Jews, do not let these differences hinder the work of God. These are all superficial elements. The mask. So this early church struggled against the collective ego. It struggled against that. But the thing is, it was eventually hijacked by the Roman Empire and became officially a religion called Christianity. And when the Roman Empire hijacked it, it suppressed all other religions, including Judaism. It had become a vast collective ego. You heard of the Crusades of the Middle Ages, right? The slaughter of Jews and Muslims in the name of Jesus. You know, we, we, we hear a lot about Paul talking about law and flesh and so forth, but we need to read it in context. When Paul critiques law and he says it's flesh, Paul is really critiquing the collective ego that his own religious tradition had become. Because in his tradition, they thought that only Jews had access to salvation. Read Galatians 2.15, we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. That's what Jews used to say. But for Jews, you can, you can be saved. You just have to become a Jew. Circumcision and all of that stuff, you enter into it. And that was the whole argument in Galatians. Is that if you believe, if you believe your religion and all your norms and practices can save you, you are living by flesh. That's what Paul is saying. The ego. The alternative to that is to live by spirit or the life of Christ, or being in Christ. These are different ways in which Paul speaks about living by spirit, in Christ, in Lord. The early church fought against the collective ego. They wanted it out of the way. And they exhorted anyone who would listen to owe no one anything but to love your neighbor as you love yourself. As I say, 
Apostle Paul describes this as being in spirit. Note I didn't say in the spirit, in spirit. There's no definite article there in the Greek. That's exactly how we say it. Because it's a way of being in spirit. Being the self that you need to be, spiritual. Being in spirit transcends personality. It transcends gender. It transcends race, class, religious rituals, and cultural norms. Flesh. So when Jesus and Paul, after him repeating, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. This reaffirms that we all share one life. In this context, Apostle Paul says to the multicultural Roman church, God is one. God is one. Now note, the Greek says God is one. It didn't say there is one God. It's a dif big difference there. To say there is one God is to assume a competition among gods. This is a statement of tribalism. But to say God is one is to say nothing exists outside of God. It's to say there is only one life with all the multifaceted ways of being, with all the multifaceted ways of being. It is one life. One single life. One. So who am I? Who am I? In John 8, 58, Jesus makes the most powerful statement that language can express. Just two words. I am. Before Abram came into being, I am. Now, it is very important that one reads this statement as part of the big picture of the early church because without the big picture, we miss the profound meaning of this statement. Most people use it to prove a doctrine. The early church were not trying to prove any doctrine. In John, Jesus' statement, I am, is not only divine proclamation, it is also human identity. Now follow me carefully. Hmm? More than this, I am is not about the I in isolation. I am is the authentic I, inseparable from being itself. I, first person, personal pronoun, am, from the verb to be. I has no integrity without being. I am, period, undefined, unqualified. This is cosmic identity. It exceeds individual and group identity. It is only when I take on this true identity that I can love my neighbor, for then I come to look in the eye of another and see my own self there. You know, the Rasta in Jamaica, they got it right. They have no word for you. It's I and I, or the I. Because that's the whole idea. Now, if we read a statement, I am, in its immediate context, we see Jesus in conversation with his fellow Jews who are obsessed about their ethnic identities and religious tradition as children of Abraham. That's the immediate context of that statement. So let's look at it. And Jesus answers them, I do not identify as a Jew or as a son of Abraham. That's my ethnic identity, but that's not my true identity. Because it is temporal. It is flesh, as Paul says. It is the mask. And that is why Jesus says to his interlocutors, before Abraham was, I am. Now let us examine this statement a little more closely. Before Abram was, I am. Now, in English, the word was and the word am 
have something in common, right? They both come from the verb to be. One is in the past, one is present. But in the, individual Greek, in the original Greek text, what the English translates as was is not from the verb to be. That word referring to Abraham is from the word ginomai, which means to happen. It refers to a historical occurrence, a happening or an event. It literally reads, before Abraham happened, before Abraham occurred, I am. What does that mean? He's not talking about Abraham's existence per se. Rather, he's talking about the Abrahamic tradition. So the conversation was to steer them away from religious cultural tribalism and point them to the immediacy and totality and oneness of being. I am. But let me press this conversation a little further in the broader context of the Johannine writings. What are the Johannine writings? The fourth gospel attributed to John and first, second, and third John. John says that the logos, the word, which is the life of God, manifests itself in Jesus of Nazareth, John 1.14. So that when one sees Jesus, one sees God, John 14, 9. But John goes on to say that the Logos, the Word, also manifests itself in us. Where does John say this? Now, twice John makes this curious statement. A lot of people keep asking about it. Even this week I was answering that on the Hope Channel. John makes this curious statement twice. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God, he says in 1 verse 18. But it is the only son who is close to God's heart that has made him known. Again, he makes the statement in 1 John 4, 12. No one has ever seen God. But... If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. Take a little time to think about that. This is to say that when we love, when we embrace this cosmic identity, we become one with God, so that when one sees us, one ought to see God. When one sees you, one ought to see God. In 1 John 4, says, 1 John 4, 7, he says, the one who loves is begotten or born of God. Hmm? Begotten of God. The one who loves as, has embraced the only authentic life-affirming identity, the cosmic identity. Now, if anyone is unsure about that, God go, uh, John goes on to say that we cannot claim to love God whom we have not seen, but what? Hate or despise our fellow human beings that we see. Cosmic identity. When you look at me, do not see my gender. Do not see the color of my skin, my ethnic hairstyle, my doctoral title, how good an Adventist I am, or any such superficial stuff, because it's all temporal and temporary. I am. And if you can declare, I am, what does that mean? Think about it. Let me press a little further in the context of the gospel. Look at the genealogy of Jesus in Luke. Look at the genealogy. The genealogy of Jesus in Luke. What does the genealogy say? Now, it says, it begins with Joseph, right? It says, Jesus, son of Joseph, I look for. Jesus, son of Joseph... As it was thought, 
Now, I can't help but saying, if Luke had traced it from Mary, he wouldn't need that disclaimer as it was thought. But let's go. <laughs> Jesus, son of Joseph, son of Heli, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of Enoch, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. Think about that. Jesus is son of God as a son of humanity. You are a son of Eve, daughter of God. Luke uses the genealogy to make the case that all humanity comes from one line that finds root, root, finds root in God. In John's philosophy, Jesus comes to demonstrate what it truly means to be human. To reinforce the Genesis account of creation, that we are by nature divine, made in divine image, daughters and sons, sons and daughters of God, so that the Jesus story is not only the story of God, it is also the story of humanity. Two sides of the same coin. Let me continue to press the argument in the context of the overall theology of the Bible. Now Moses is to go into Egypt to pull off one of the boldest rescue missions in history. He wants to know the name of the God who is sending him. What is his name, Moses asks. Does Moses receive a name? Does he receive a name? No. I am. This is the thing. Moses' question, what is his name, is loaded with the sentiment of a culture filled with hundreds of tribal gods. The answer, I am, is a rebuke. You stand in the presence of infinite being, undefined, unqualified, unquantified. Infinite being that does not identify with any particular tribe or any other finite reality. I am. It is an invitation to Moses to detach from tribal identity and personality. To shed the mask. Put your ego aside. And become fully aware, fully aware of being present and all-encompassing. Because it is by embracing the power of the very life in which Moses share. It's in shedding that mask. It's in participating, I am, that he will be able to pull off this bold act of liberation in Egypt. I am is freedom. So let me repeat. I am is not only divine decoration, it is also human identity. Now, but to say I am is not to say I am God. No. To say I am is not to say I am God. Rather, it is to say that I am part of something infinitely greater than myself or my church or my race on my country. And the more I become conscious of who I am, the more the ego shrinks. And I detach myself from the superficial things. I cast off the mask. And every moment becomes a divine calling upon my life. And I approach every task and every relationship with faithfulness and integrity, with justice and with love. So let me say this to everyone in my hearing. Regardless of what you think about yourself, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what anyone thinks about you, whoever you are, whatever your station is in life, you are a holy thing. 
You're not a piece of meat. You're not a piece of meat to be judged by your skin shade. You're not a piece of meat to be judged by the possession of particular body parts or the sizes thereof. Or by the shape of your nose or the value that a financial institution places upon you. You are a holy thing. Word of God manifests, waiting to manifest. God spoke and you came into being. Let us make humanity in our own image. So here in this world, we're on a journey towards something infinitely better than ourselves. Pure mystery of the cosmos, deep within. We cannot explain it. We need not explain it. We cannot enforce it. In my dream, I wander the hills and the deep blue sea, the whole creation, wonder, and majesty. I awaken and behold the wonder and the mystery right, is right here with me, the one who sees it all. Boundless life, pure magic, beyond logic, beyond knowledge, beyond need to systematize and lock down in creed. Little Rock demonstrates human forgetfulness of its divinity. Hmm? Culture, tradition, and ideology in the name of religion and in the name of God has dumbed down our consciousness so that we separate children from their parents at the borders, locking them in cages as though we ourselves are frightened, preying upon the poor and the destitute for our own security. Silencing women called by God in the name of unity, survival. Because we have forgotten who we are. The root of evil in this world, my friends, is the direct result of the human anxiety over its survival. One person. One group believes that its survival depends on the suppression of another. That is the cause of greed and envy and boastfulness and racism and sexism and religious sectarianism. As long as humanity is primarily consumed with survival, the law of the jungle will prevail. Doesn't matter how high tech we become, the law of the jungle still prevails. The Little Rock Nine, El Paso, the carnage in the Middle East, the lawless killing of black people by law enforcement personnel, the violence against women, whether at home, at the workplace, or in the religious institution that tells them they cannot represent God. It's all about the ego, survival. It is the mask that we put on to scare each other into subjection. Because we are driven by fear, survival anxiety. Humanity created in the image of God ought not to be anxious over its survival. What does Jesus say in Matthew 6, 25 to 34? Look at the birds of the air. They neither reap nor sow nor gather into barns. Are you not of more value than they? Do not worry about your survival, Jesus says. But seek first the kingdom of God and what? Hmm? Now you read in your Bible, righteousness. The original text actually says justice. That's what the Greek says. Seek first the kingdom of God and his justice. That means in everything, do to others as you'd have them do to you. That means love your neighbor as you love yourself. As Jesus says, this one law is the same as loving God. So, as a faith community, we must transcend the ego. We should not perpetuate a culture of survival. No, this is not to be in a faith community. Humanity came into this world with a higher calling than mere survival. 
Survival is basic animal instinct. Survival is the law of the jungle. Dog eat dog, as we say in Jamaica. But we, humanity, have come into this world to discover our true identity, to nurture back in each other the, the, the divine image, to bring healing and wholeness to a creation, groaning, groaning to be free. And so I, in answering the question, who am I? I must embark upon that journey of liberation. Because like Moses, and like Jesus, I have come to know I am. Who am I? I am. I am is the one thing on which all humanity agree. Cosmic identity. I am is liberation. I am free. Think on these things. Amen.